So I was going to say that it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is one of the um, relatively small number of, uh, of, of cities in a um, what is strictly speaking, I suppose, a non-anglophone country where I can assume that my English will be better understood than at home, which is a very, very nice feeling. Um, uh, 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 since everybody in Norway seems to speak English better than we do. Now, um, I, it's my second lecture today, and so I'm probably quite tired, but I will do my best to keep this exciting. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to be t talk about my book, and the first point I would want to make, particularly since you all read and English so well, is that listening to me is not a substitute for reading the book, <laughs> uh, because I can only cover a very small part of what the book is about adequately in a lecture of 40 minutes. And I would be very disappointed if you went home and felt, well, now we know enough about that, we don't need to read the book. That would be absolutely the wrong purpose. What I want you to go away with and feel is, that was really interesting, now I must read why he thought this. And so please go out and uh, Three topics, which is, of course, uh, relating to the global financial crisis, what I think of as the global financial crisis, though I admit that's a little parochial, since... The crisis directly affected mainly, basically, the Western world, and the Western world is not the globe, but still it is, from a financial sector point of view, most of the globe. That is to say, the financial sector that dissolved so frighteningly in large part in 2008 uh, is, over, is, alas, uh, overwhelmingly dominated by uh, and centered upon the West. So thinking of it as a global financial crisis doesn't seem to me completely unreasonable. It seems to me quite reasonable. Now what I'm going to talk about is first why uh, even seven years or eight years after it began, it's, uh, almost eight years, seven and a half years, and seven years since it got to be, uh, uh, or getting on for seven years from it, when it got to be its worst, why this is an important topic and remains relevant today in the actual economic performance of the world. And uh, then the second thing I'm going to talk about is my explanation or analysis of why this crisis happened. What, what was underlay this? And therefore, in some sense, how do we understand it? And then the final section of what I want to talk about is what are some of the policy issues that arise. Now, my discussion of the policy issues is quite rich and complex. I have a terrible tendency, which is either good or bad, to want to cover everything. So the good thing about my book is it gives you an entree into almost every aspect of the thinking about this crisis. And even if you disagree with me, you'll find many, many references to the literature and what people are thinking about it. The bad thing about it is there's an awful lot of stuff there. And the result is that I can only discuss a few aspects of it. So let me start, if I might, with why this matters. Um, well, think about it this way. Um, back in the, what I now think of as the dim and distant days of 2005 or even six, there was a view which I refer to in the book as the old orthodoxy of Western macroeconomic policy making, supported by most, not all by any means, but most conventional academic opinion, which went roughly like this. If we have um, uh, uh, balanced budgets or at least sustainable public debt positions, I won't get into the question of what those should look like. If we have uh, central banks that successfully target inflation, uh, at about 2%, which was interpreted as meaning that over time they were succeeding in getting actual output close to measure, their measures of potential output. That's what meant, that was what was implied by success in targeting inflation. And if we had relatively competitive, open, liberalized financial sectors, 
then we would have both stability and dynamic growth. That was the, the, the conceit, if you like, uh, in both senses of the word conceit, uh, uh, the imagination of major policymakers. And I cite, among others, a very significant and interesting speech on this theme, which was built around the idea, very popular at the time, of the great moderation um, from Ben Bernanke. And I do so not to pour scorn on him, I think he's a very major economic thinker and policy maker, but just to indicate how significant and how widely spread and widely shared was this view. Now what we know now is that that was completely wrong. I mean, I mean completely wrong. It turned out, in fact, that the stability we saw was an illusion, that we were on the verge of an enormous financial crisis, uh, arguably the biggest financial crisis per se that we know of um, in the sense of what happened to the financial sector, uh, which had to be comprehensively rescued by the major Western states, completely rescued by it, by putting the entire balance sheet of the states behind them behind the financial uh, uh, system. But anyway, the financial sector dissolved. There was a huge recession, the biggest since the 30s. It was almost a global recession, and most economies, in fact, shrank, or a very large number of economies around the world shrank in 2008. Uh, nine, unemployment exploded upwards. Uh, so in terms of the economic effect, as well as the financial crisis, it was an enormous shock. And nobody, I, this is an exaggeration, there were a number of people who foresaw some of it. I myself foresaw a little bit of it. I certainly didn't foresee as much of it as some did. But with really one or two exceptions, few people imagined a dissolution of the system on this scale. And I can, I've listed the exceptions in my book, and I admire them. So, uh, this is a pretty ma massive failure of, of the institutional machinery of the Western economy, both policy making and the financial sector itself, and of course, and that's of particular importance to me, a massive failure of economic understanding. Uh, we didn't understand uh, what was going on. And, um, I, in trying to, and I think, as I said, I include myself in significant measure as part of this, uh, of the people who weren't adequately understood this. And it seems to me clear when we think, when I think about it now, that there were certain strands of thinking, which understood much better than I had what was likely to happen in a period called or believed to be a great moderation. And to my mind, the most interesting such thinker, and I cite him in my book, is Hyman Minsky, uh, uh, a sort of heterodox Keynesian in a sense, who actually studied at the Chicago, uh, Chicago University, interesting fact, who died in the mid-90s, wrote a series of books about the, the instability of capitalism. And his most important point, which I take very much to heart, and it seems to me a fundamental fact about the capitalist system, if you understand the role of balance sheets, which is the key point. He really incorporates balance sheets into his analysis, which orthodox economics basically ignores, treats as, uh, uh, as irrelevant, essentially because of the assumption that bankruptcy doesn't matter. But his ba basic idea I capture, or he cap I think he captures himself in two words, Stability destabilizes. That is to say, in long periods of stability, uh, people perceive uh, after a time, under value, under appreciate the level of risk, and are prepared to take on more risk. But more insignificantly, they create risk endogenously. And the main way we create risk endogenously with a liberalized financial sector is we expand debt. We expand credit. Debt is just the liability side of credit. I, we expand leverage in the economy. And for the people who are doing this, this seems very, very profitable. And in the short to medium run, it is immensely profitable. But unfortunately, it also makes the economy very fragile. And when some shock occurs, and in this case it's a shock directly related to the leverage process itself, which was 
in the property sector, the leverage cis structures will collapse and you'll end with a depression. And that was Minsky's analysis of the Great Depression, and I think it's very, very relevant to where we are. And I think economists, even today, with very few distinguished exceptions, are not prepared to take on board the radicalism of this insight, and particularly the significance of balance sheets, which I was aware of before, in explaining the, the fragility of the economy and the way different actors, businesses, financial businesses, and the government interconnect in stress periods. Now, I said I would talk a bit about why it matters from one other respect. Um, so I've now talked about, if you like, the intellectual and institutional failing. But the second point I want to make on why it matters is that this crisis has generated enormous losses in output relative to previous expectations. We are, by and large, growing economies. We are used to growth, so we estimate, so I'm evaluate, evaluating uh, outcomes relative to the pre-crisis expectations, which are of continuous improvements in standards of living. So this is a chart for the US. It, the, the red line shows US actual GDP since 1950 on a quarterly basis. The blue line shows what would have happened if the trend from 50 to 2007 had continued. On the right-hand side, I, with the green line, I show the deviation of the actual, uh, of the actual output from the, uh, the trend output as a share, as a, ra rate, as a ratio of the potential output, and you can see that by 20, the second quarter or third, no, I think it's, the, sorry, this is the most up, fourth quarter of 2014, or in the third quarter of 2014, US GDP was roughly 17% smaller than it would have been if the trend had continued. That's an absolutely enormous loss. Nothing like that has been seen, as you can see very clearly looking at the Green Line, since the Second World War. This chart for it showed for a shorter period a similar analysis for the Eurozone, the other huge economy affected. I don't have time to look at the UK and other economies. This is only goes back to 95 because it's quite difficult to construct GDP series for the Eurozone going back. I didn't have time to do that myself. And the pre-crisis growth was slower, um, but two things come out of this chart. The first and most important is that since the crisis hit, the Eurozone slumped and since then, it basically hasn't grown. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a stagnant, it's a story of actual, absolute economic stagnation. To be precise, in the most recent quarter, Eurozone GDP in aggregate was still 2% smaller than it had been in the first quarter of 2000 and, uh, 2008, with the, the best picture before the crisis. So the Eurozone economy in aggregate is still significantly smaller. Real demand in the Eurozone, by the way, is 5% smaller than it was before the crisis. The cushioning effect of the big balance of payment shift has helped. So the losses are very large. In a number of countries, unemployment was very high. Long-term unemployment has been very high. Lots of other effects on people uh, which matter. So that's the first point, why this matters. So the second point I want to discuss is why this happened. Uh, what is my story? Well, broadly speaking, and I've given you the very, very loose, uh, 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 the outline in the stability destabilizes point. My broad argument is this, and I think it fits into a sort of Minskyan view. Minsky talked about uh, triggers or displacement effects and then about the way the financial sector then starts a leverage cycle. Uh, he thought of it mostly in relationship to the corporate sector. He lived at a time when most debt was accumulated by the corporate sector, which is very much what happened in Japan, by the way, in the late 80s. Our experience has been different, and in some ways worse, in that most of the leverage in the last, uh, in the run-up to the crisis, was generated in the household sector. And that, that changed its impact, but I don't have time to discuss this in more detail now. Anyway, uh, my argument in the column, in the book, is there was a macroeconomic trigger, a series of events which generated, um, if you like, an important shift in macroeconomic conditions. Uh, I will just discuss one aspect of that. And this 
shift, which I will show you in the next chart in a second, uh, then triggered a, uh, 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 a shift in asset prices, which encouraged, allowed, and motive, indeed motivated the beginning of a massive credit boom in a number of economies which had highly credit elastic financial systems, highly elastic financial systems, and which were operating in an extremely favorable environment for a uh, credit, credit uh, boom. So this chart is incredibly simplistically, uh, as I say, there's much more in the book, outlines, if you like, in a terribly simple way, the story. Uh, the whole story of the crisis in one chart. So I will try and explain what this crisis, what this chart tries to show. So first of all, there's a really important price. I think the most important price in explaining what happens to long-term asset prices, sort of basic notion in economics, and that price is the real interest rate, the real interest rate on safe assets. It drives. Uh, it, it's a trigger for asset price movements, um, uh, particularly longer term real assets, of which the most important for this purpose is property assets because they're, they're assets against which it is most easy to borrow. In nearly all, actually in all financial systems I know of, uh, the principal collateral is property. So big movements in property prices tend normally to generate big movements in property-related lending, which looks very, very safe because the asset prices are rising, so you don't need to worry anymore about, uh, about whether people can pay service the debt even because the asset price, asset itself cushions any risk. It, it bears uh, the risk. So it's that link that's crucial. So for, as a proxy for the real interest rate, I took uh, the real uh, interest rate, the interest rate in real terms, inflation adjusted terms, on the liabilities of a triple, then triple A rated, but still largely triple A rated government, um, which had been issuing index linked securities for a long time and had a very liquid market in them. And it so happens it's one I know very well, it's the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, there are a number of other big countries that have also been issuing index-linked securities more recently. One of the most important, of course, the most important is the US. I don't have it here. I have other charts which show it in the book. But basically, for the period we have the US, it tracks the UK very well. And that's what you would expect, because the real interest rate ought to be, it's a highly, these are very tradable commodities, very liquid markets, pretty safe. So uh, you would expect capital markets, other things equal, there are a few problems with real exchange rates, to e equalize these real interest rates. And if you look at the real interest rate, this is a very remarkable picture. And this, as I said, is I think the most important real price in the world system. If you're interested in capitalism, the real interest rate is a pretty important price. <coughs> So if you look back in the mid-90s, you will see the real interest rate, which you can read on the right side, as measured by the UK and extreme guilt, was close to 4%, which is roughly what you would expect in a period of dynamic growth. Between 97 and 99, it fell from close to 4 to 2, and almost half. This is a massive shift, massive reduction. So something big had to happen there, and I'll discuss in a moment what happened. Um, and you will see at the... Uh, then that it moves on in close to 2% till about 2007 when something else big happens. Well, we already know what that is. And then the real interest rate fell below zero and it's basically remained near zero or below ever since. The real interest rate on all comparable uh, liabilities of governments, that is to say on governments deemed safe, have been zero to negative now for about seven years. That's our really freakish situation has no precedent as far as we know. Now if a real interest rate collapses you'd expect long-term real assets to start rising in price uh, because the discount factor has fallen so much and that's exactly what has happened for three very important <coughs> property markets. These are the housing markets of the US, UK and Spain which were the three most affected in the developed world by these booms. In house, in house prices and consumption associated with this. And you can see they all start to rise about 97, 98, 99 as the house price, as the real interest rate um, collapses. Real house prices continue to rise to, in the US to 2005, 6, 
and in Spain and the UK till about 2007. They then turned down. Um, in the process of their rising, the housing prices never adjust instantaneously, they're not that sort of market. An enormous expansion in credit happened, which I don't have time to discuss. Enormous expansion in leverage in the whole economy occurred. An enormous expansion in the leverage of household sectors in all these economies occurred. In the US and Spain, there was also an immense building boom. And because of this immense building boom, they actually generated oversupply of housing. People had been buying housing, not taking that into account, because people are myopic. They started looking at these rising real prices and said, that'll go on forever. Let's not worry about it. Let's just keep borrowing and lending. So lots of people started borrowing and lending at the peak. Um, then house prices started to fall, and then suddenly the financial sector realized it had a really big problem. It lent to a lot of people against house prices whose value was now declining in both nominal and real terms, so the collateral no longer was good. Uh, and so they stopped lending, completely, just stopped. And once they stopped lending, of course, the house price boom collapsed further, uh, and uh, as that started to happen, people started pulling their money out of the institutions that had lent all this money in different ways, or had been engaged in promoting the lending. And that started triggering a major house, a major financial uh, crisis. Uh, and you can see that related to the subsequent uh, declines. So that, very, very much in brief, is my story, the brief story of how it happened. Now, this is related, as I said, to something very important that happened. What happened in 2007, you know. What happened between 97 and 99. And my argument, answer on that is the most important thing that happened then was the Asian financial crisis. And the, the Asian financial crisis from which China also learned. China also learned. And what these emerging countries, which had had um, large current, perhaps will trigger questions, is what can we do about this? What are the lessons uh, that we should uh, 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 learn from this experience. Um, well, there are two sorts of issues that arise here, and I try to deal both. The first is, what can we do about the macroeconomic triggers? This very strange situation, which I discuss at length, in which capital is flowing predominantly from poorer countries to rich countries, and within the rich world, from some rich countries to other rich countries, predominantly the US, much the most important, but also the UK, another very large deficit country, um, and uh, where, where it is clearly, comprehensively, and totally wasted. This is a very strange, inefficient, irrational, and historically unprecedented way for a global economy to operate with a global capital market. It's absolutely insane, for example, in my view, that the Chinese people have accumulated roughly $3,000 a head, 3000 and this is a lot of money for Chinese people, of claims on Western uh, governments which unambiguously will return them a sizable negative real return. So this is a dysfunction of the global monetary and financial systems at a macro level uh, of a very high order. And the second question that all this I'm going to leave aside the question of what was the optimal macroeconomic response to the crisis, fiscal monetary policy mix, we can discuss that later if you want to do so, quantitative easing and so on. The other big issue, obviously, is, okay, crises are going to happen from time to time, there will be asset price bubbles, they will deflate, but really we don't want the whole financial system to implode because house prices go down a bit. Because that's going to happen from time to time. So how do we have a more resilient financial system, a substantially more resilient financial system than the one we had? And I'd like to talk about those questions. Before I do, I'd just like to discuss a little bit about what I call the new orthodoxy, which is how the official sector, as it were, the policymakers, have responded to this crisis. Um, so the answer to that is quite interesting, I think. What has changed and what has not changed? Um, uh, well, the, the, the broad answer to this is our macro policy regime has not changed in any way, shape or form, except that we are like prepared, as we've seen in a crisis, 
to be more radical in monetary policy measures than we would otherwise, than we would have been before. QE was not something that was widely discussed other than in Japan before this crisis. So that is a change, but it's a response to the crisis and everybody treats it as an abnormal uh, and exceptional uh, policy. We still have inflation targeting, the, despite some discussion in the literature of having a higher, uh, the merit of having a higher target as a cushion against getting to the zero bound. The targets have not been changed anywhere. Nobody's moved away from inflation targeting to price level targeting, nominal GDP targeting, or any of the other ideas that have come about. Everybody still assumes that the right fiscal policy is balanced or near balanced, so we got back to a massive fiscal contraction in most developed countries in the last uh, five or uh, six years. So the macro policy response is there isn't one. In essence, the regime we had before was perfect, and there's no reason to change it. The other uh, thing we've done is we have massively increased the regulation of the financial se sector. But we have, and I've got some discussion of this, and I won't give you a great deal, we've done so with an immense increase in the complexity of the rule book. I mean, on a staggering scale, I provide some evidence that the new rule book in the US to governing the financial sector will comprise the primary rule book, at least 30,000 pages of rules. In the Euros, in the EU, it looks as though it's going to be double that amount. And if you think that, that either the regulators or the banks can implement such a legal, league, such a rule book in a sensible, intelligent, and flexible way, you're much more optimistic about regulators and banks than I am. Um, uh, the, the, the big failure, in my view, on the, uh, uh, on the um, there, there are many others, but the core failure, I think, in the approach to the banking sector is to be to dare to grapple with the principal single source of fragility. There are many reasons, but the most important single one by far is that the banking sector is chronically and colossally undercapitalized. Now, before the crisis, and that this was hidden uh, in our risk weighting systems, the system we use to risk weight assets, which essentially allow banks to pretend that risky assets, that assets don't exist. They can get rid of them because they can say they're actually safe, so we don't need any capital against them. This is officially allowed. It's a fraud in my view, but it's officially allowed, and I explained in my book why I think it's a fraud. Uh, it has to do with risk management models, which are beautifully discussed in a brilliant column by my friend and colleague John Kay this morning, so you should read it. He explained beautifully why this is absurd. But anyway, as a result of using the risk-weighted models, the real leverage, which nobody knew, nobody knew before the crisis of the major financial institutions of the Western world, was in the range of 40 to 50 to 1. That is to say, if they lost 2% of the value of their assets, they were gone. Now, that's a zero cushion. So, obviously, we've increased that. Um, substantially, and if you look at the leverage ratio, say, of the British banking system now, the major banks, they are now, thank God, down to the really solid level of 20 to 25 to 1. So now they only need to lose 4%. Uh, they now they have to lose as much as 4 or 5% of the value of their assets before they're insolvent. Of course, there will be runs long before that. Now, my view is very close to that of some other economists who've been writing on this. These are ludicrously overcapitalized, undercapitalized institutions, particularly given their scale and therefore the incredible difficulty of backing them up in a crisis. We're talking about institutions whose balance sheets are in the neighborhood of one and a half to two trillion dollars each. And that's a staggering amount of risk that is underpinned by next to no equity. So my view is the single most important thing to do in dealing with this is to deleverage the financial uh, uh, the financial sector dramatically. Um, there is one other issue I discuss at great length, which I think is a genuinely interesting uh, um, idea, uh, which is so-called macroprudential policy. And the idea there is that whatever requirements we have in terms of the safety of the banking system should be strongly countercyclical. That makes sense. Clearly, we would want leverage ratios in the banking system and of borrowers uh, 
to be uh, particularly tight in boom times, increase capital in boom times, so you can run it down in bad times. It's actually the inverse of what tends to happen. I think it's a good idea, but it will be much easier to operate if it's around much higher capital ratios than now. And my own view is that 10 to 1 is the maximum leverage we should permit. Now, there's a very important implication of this, which I'm just going to mention in passing, but it's probably the most controversial part of my book. If we dramatically reduce the leverage uh, in our banking sector, then the banks, uh, which um, today generate, produce, generate, invent, make, up, make, create, print, if you like, most of the money in our economies, are likely to print less of it. And it is possible, as a result, and many monetarists argue this, that we will have too little money in our economies. There's a very simple solution to that problem. The government can create the money. It's the government's money anyway. And we have got into this very strange position in the Western world where we, and this of course was a perception, this profound perception goes back to the great uh, uh, Swedish economist Knut Vixell, uh, in which we think that the money that the banking sector generates on the back ultimately of the ability of the central bank to rescue them, to provide real money, government money, in a crisis, is safer than money that the central bank simply creates all on its own, which of course it isn't. The central bank cannot go insolvent, they can, um, if the central bank can overinflate, of course. And therefore I discuss at great length the ideas for, um, well, 100% reserve banking, you could imagine it could be 30% reserve banking, uh, um, in other words, uh, we go back to the Chicago School of the 1930s, the idea that the government should once again play a significant role in creating, uh, in creating money rather than delegating it entirely to the financial sector, which has done such a spectacularly bad job of it. The final point I'd like to make, so that's the financial sector question, and I'm just going to park, and we can come back if you want, to this question of the role of government in creating money as an alternative to this total dependence on the financial sector and above all the banking industry to generate it in the very erratic way it does. A panic, of course, is generated, as I discuss at length, because people who've got deposits in banks, which they think is their money, this includes companies, which they believe are really, really safe, it's the, the money that which they can rely to pay their bills, to meet their obligations, whatever happens, happens to be backed by a whole raft of incredibly risky long-term loans, which can go bang at any moment. And that generates fundamental structural instability in our financial system. Now, the second thing I'd just like to talk about very, very briefly is the, this question of global macro and, uh, and eurozone macro. Um, now, you wouldn't be surprised if I just make two points here. The first sort of euro and global macro uh, is that the world is really finding it unbelievably difficult to absorb in a productive and efficient way, and that's shown by real interest rates, shown by the credit bubbles we generate, to, to absorb in an efficient way the savings that some countries and some people are trying to generate. So the huge surpluses of uh, big countries like Germany, China before the crisis. You're lucky because you're small, thank God. Uh, Norway is the country of 80, billion, 80 million with a comparable uh, net asset, proportional net asset position. But anyway, the problem is, where are the investors that are on the other side of this? Of this? We've discovered that within the developed world, our capacity to absorb the surplus savings that have been generated by oil exporters like you, by countries like Germany, uh, by emerging countries, is basically, it isn't there. Our companies don't want to borrow. Very few major Western corporations are now net borrowers. It's really very important. They're not doing big investments. Our households were willing to borrow, but most of them are bust now. Our governments are still willing to borrow, but many people are increasingly concerned about that. So the savers don't have uh, good borrowers. That's why the real interest rates are so low. It's also why money is driving asset prices, other asset prices are up so high. So the question, how do you do something about this? Well, I argue that one thing we can do is increase 
public investment. There are a lot of countries that can increase public investment. It's clearly a need in the US, the UK. I would argue it's a need in Germany as well. But I also argue we could invest more in developing countries if developing countries felt safer. Why are they accumulating 12, to, not entirely the emerging countries, but mostly developed countries? Why are they accumulating trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of insurance at this great cost? Because they don't feel safe in an open financial system. So I will just conclude with this point. This was precisely the concern, though then he was focusing on trade, that animated uh, much of Keynes' discussion and what he felt about these issues in the Bretton Woods discussion, except we now have capital market op account opening as well. One of the most interesting things we have allowed to happen, and I just focus on this, is that the International Monetary Fund, which in theory is our insurance system against financial disaster, has shrunk to such a small proportion that it's completely incapable of insuring countries against major risks. The aggregate lending capacity of the IMF is only about a trillion dollars, which is obviously tiny against the reserves. And of course, it comes with all sorts of conditionality uh, which emerging and developing countries can't bear, and then it's dominated by our Western governments, particularly European and American ones, of course, which makes it inimical. But I argue we could have a much balance, better balanced world economy with investment funds going into countries that, could, that really need the money to accelerate development if we had a, a better insurance system and a better transmission mechanism. And part of that, in my view, is greatly increasing the resources available to an institution like the fund, I don't care whether it is the fund, and changing its governance in the same way. And if so, we might eliminate this absurd situation we are seen still to be stuck in, and I think we're going back in, in which basically we end up with these huge deficits in developed countries which turn out not to be able to use them productively. So I think I've gone up for about three or four minutes, but what I said I'd talk about 45 minutes. I think that's what I've done. I've tried to outline at least some of the issues that my book raises, the framework in which I'm thinking about these things. I'd be very happy to take questions for half an hour or so. I think people want me to, well, uh, for as long as you want. And thank you for listening.